everyone. I'm Maureen McGuigan, Deputy Director of Arts and Culture for Lackawanna County, your weekly host for Lackawanna County Arts and Culture Live, which uh, showcases our local talent here in the county. Um, one of the things I love hearing each week is about different artist processes where they kind of give us a peek behind the curtain uh, and tell us about their artist journey. Tonight we have um, a nice mix. We have visual artist Travis Prince, who will be taking us through his painting process, uh, followed by poet Laurel Rajeski. I'm really excited, our first poet on the show. And then we're going to wind down the evening with the beautiful music of Jacob Cole, who will be playing the hand pan for us. As always, thank you to Electric City Television, who helps produce this show with us, and Jess Mione, um, Arts Council member, who does a great job promoting it so that you know who's up and coming for the evening. So let's get started, and we'll bring on our first guest, Travis Prince. Well, hi, Travis. We're so uh, thrilled to have you on the show. You're such a wonderful artist, but also you're so involved in our community. I've so enjoyed getting to know you and, and work with you probably, I'd say, over the, the past year when we first connected. Uh, so it's, it's great to have you on this Lackawanna Arts and Culture Live where we showcase our great, great artists. So how are you? Doing good? Pretty good. Thanks. Thanks, yeah. Marie, for, for inviting me on here. I'm, I'm doing really well today. Yeah, so let's start out because your first love is being an artist and creating work. How, how did you um, become an artist and your, your journey as an artist? Uh, well, I think I've been an artist my entire life. Uh, my earliest memories are of drawing and coloring, and it kind of stuck with me for a while. Uh, I thought I would have pursued it as a career choice, uh, but I didn't. I, I did a... Um, a bunch of different jobs earlier on and um, I don't know it was it was around 2008 or 2009 I really got this this urge to create more than I had been over the past few years and um, I started painting and I don't really know what it was that kind of clicked in me but I around that time I, I kind of figured like if, if I if I put the time into this and I pursue it and I, I try to perfect this craft, I think I, I could be good at actually painting. And so since 2009, I've, I've been taking it uh, really serious and, and just trying to uh, perfect my craft and, and create images that are, are beautiful and, and thought provoking pieces that uh, spark conversations. Well, I think that's a w well said because I, you know, your different life experiences, I wonder if they've helped you as an artist. Cause one of the things I love about your work is the people feel so real and the emotions, there's often a lot of joy in your paintings, but there's also, you know, some serious topics, but I just feel like I, I want to meet these people or I know them. Is, is that something you strive for in, in your work? I, I want, I want the viewer to, to have that sense of familiarity with, with the image itself and so I try to tell people like when you see them it should feel like that's your nephew or your uncle or your brother or your neighbor it's it I want I want my images to feel comfortable to people and I like because I, I was a history major and I also love literature you often put um, like even in the painting behind you uh, books especially related to the black experience like I just love those details it makes me want to go look them up and has that been important to you it's kind of like a way to educate I don't know if educates the right word but but those details in your paintings I find very interesting uh, yes and and educate is the word that I would okay <laughs> because and in, in, in my in my reading, I come across a lot of books that I find hold valuable information. And when I try to have discussions about these particular topics, I find that uh, very little people have read these books or are aware of the authors of these books. And so I, I took it upon myself to create my reader series specifically to help make people aware of literature that they may potentially be oblivious to any other way and in an effort to, to educate. Oh, I'm glad that I used the right word because yeah I think it is and I think that art can do that and it's important because sometimes art has a way of waking us up and and maybe speaking to us in a way that just a lecture or, so, or something doesn't so. Exactly. so so thank you for that. Uh, 
And I think that's in a good, a good segue to, you, you do wear a lot of hats and like I said, you really help our community. And I know you've been a big part of Black's Grant Project, which is just wonderful too. They've really educated our community and have really become the fabric of our social life and, and, and let people know about our, um, the history and grants and the really rich history, both the history, but also what's going on now. So uh, do you want to tell her, you have an event coming up that was the first one last year, Juneteenth, which I was thrilled about. We have a lot of, you know, it's kind of, we have the Irish, the Polish, and the Italian, and it's great, you know, to celebrate all our diversity and heritage. Can you tell us a little bit about what Jun Juneteenth is and what Black Scranton is, is doing this week for it? Uh, so, yeah, Black Scranton was founded by Glennis Johns, and she's a, a Scranton native, and she put together this project, like you said, in order to help everyone be aware of the, the rich history of the Scranton and Lackawanna area. And uh, last year we hosted a Juneteenth event for the most part because a lot of people, once again, are unaware of these things. And so what Juneteenth is, is a celebration of the last day of slavery. Uh, the Emancipation Proclamation was signed in 1863. Uh, in the Deep South, slave owners who did not want to give up their property moved further west where it wasn't as strictly enforced as it was in the South and closer to the East Coast. And so for another two years, there was uh, still slave practicing going on. And in 1865, on June 19th, the last plantation and slave owners in Texas were notified that they had to tell their slaves that they had received their freedom. And now we, we celebrate that day and commemorate that day as a historical moment where the African diaspora was released from bondage in America. Yeah, it's a great day in American history. So I think it's a one. I'm so happy that our city is now celebrating that. And you know, this may be a difficult topic, but I think we need to acknowledge it. Our, our country is still healing. Uh, yes. There's a lot of issues right now, but do you see the power, what is the power of art? I mean, sometimes art seems small, but it can be so important in building those uh, understandings and healing communities. Yes, uh, the power of art is, it is able to comfort the disturbed and disturb the comfort. I love that quote. It's true. Art both heals us, but also wakes us up to things that maybe we yes. were ignorant to. So that, that's just and a great quote. I, like once you said, uh, an image is worth a thousand words. So a piece of art can say something that it would take a lecturer minutes or hours to try to express. And you can gleam the, the same concept in a, in a fraction of a moment by, by viewing certain art. So uh, art is, is, is very valuable to our, our social fabric. It's something that mankind, it's innate to us. The oldest things that we can find that we've left on this planet is art. Is, and we've been doing it since drawing on cave walls. It's, it's our way of communication. That's beautifully said. Uh, that's kind of a good segue. And before we, we hear about, you're going to talk about your process as an artist, but I, I, one of the other things I love about you as an artist is that you're very supportive of other artists. And I think you've done a lot to help people and you even have your own show. Do you want to talk a little bit about and encourage people maybe to come and check your show, the round table out? Oh yes. So uh, I actually host a show. It's called uh, electric city television's round table discussions, which is Scranton's uh, fine nickname. Uh, yeah. the electric city so we definitely chose that for the title and I sit down and I have other local artists visual artists uh, mostly painters but I've interviewed photographers as well and to help them get exposure and bring them on and and talk about their creative process and what helps them stay motivated and what are their goals and what are some of their favorite achievements and and just having fun, interesting conversations with local artists. And it's, uh, it's, it's a really good time. And we are on our uh, Scranton's um, local channel. Mm -hmm. And I think season, we're filming season two now, so we don't have dates yet. It's still COVID season, so things are, are kind of iffy, but we'll definitely have some new episodes and I'll keep everybody posted with, with links and dates for those. 
Yeah, and we'll try to get that word out. And we love ECTV, so I try to plug them every week because I, yes. you know, they're very yes. helpful. And I don't, you're a busy guy because I know I'm going to switch you over now, but you said you've been doing a, a, I don't know where you find time to do all this, but uh, you've been doing a lot of commission work too, which is awesome that you're, you're getting commissions. Um, uh, yes. Uh, right now, I, I have my hands filled with several projects. I just, uh, this year alone, I've probably done, I've completed uh, three paintings for clients. One, one client was a, a repeat client, and she brought a bigger, more elaborate piece this time around. A friend of mine had me customize some sneakers for him. I'm working on two more commissions now. Uh, there's a, a young lady, uh, a young entrepreneur from Scranton. She's opening up a event and entertainment hall titled The Johnny Pump Room. And I think I may be doing some mural work for her. Uh, I currently, uh, I'm employed with um, Outreach Community Center for Resources. I've been doing mural projects at, at our facilities. So just, it's, it's to the point where I'm, I'm feeling like I'm achieving my dream and art is my life right now. Like my entire life is art. <laughs> oh, what an inspiring message. So I'm gonna jump out so that we can actually hear you talk about your process and art. I'm really looking forward to that. And then I'll jump back in to say goodbye. But again, thanks for being on the show. It was so nice to have a moment to sit down. I really appreciate it. And I'll talk with you in a little while. Okay. All right, guys. So what I'm currently working on here, hope I can get, let me take this, uh, up there. But uh, this piece uh, is a piece that I already completed and a client uh, wanted the piece, was a little bit out of his price range. So we agreed to redo the piece on a smaller scale. So I got the image on the canvas and what the, the basic process that I do is you sketch out your image, you want to get your image secured to the canvas because I, I just use normal pencils. So after I sketch it, I'll get black acrylic paint and outline the sketch itself so that it's, it's stuck on there so I won't lose the drawing. And then I do a process called washing or toning the canvas where you're, you're giving the white canvas a, a color to let the oil paints have a pigment to refract off of and initially, It'll help your first layer of paint be that much more vibrant so you can see exactly where you want to go from there. And I think I may have Oh, here's that. And here is a, a quick snapshot of how I do my pieces. You start Is that glare at me? So start with a drawing. You outline your drawing and tone your canvas. And then the next step we do is known as a underpainting. And what the underpainting is, is basically a, your foundation layer of paint. And you want your under layer to be as dark as possible without losing the image itself. And that way you can build your mid-tones and your light tones upon your darker colors. And that what in effect gives oil paintings that lush roundness to it, that it, it kind of gives it that 3D, three-dimensional pop to it. And so this is a, a very, very old process a uh, tried and true process that will give you good results every time. And the main thing is, is patience. So a light sketch, tone your, tone your canvas, underpainting, take your time, you have a complete piece. So what I wanna do here is, I wanna finish toning this canvas and getting this prepped and ready to be painted. And then after that, I have another piece that is already has an underpainting on it. And we're gonna mix some skin tones. And I wanna show you guys the colors that I use and the medium that I use and how I mix and blend my skin tones. 
and we're going to work on uh, adding the third layer to another piece. So let's work on finishing painting this canvas. And for the tone, we use acrylic paints, which are water soluble and they dry really fast, which is one of the best things about acrylics. Some people would tone their canvases with oil paints. It just takes a little bit longer to dry. It, but it doesn't, I don't think it makes a significant difference if you tone with oil or if you use uh, acrylic paints as your medium. I get a wide brush and wet the canvas a little bit. And it really doesn't take a lot of paint. And you can tone with almost any color, reds, blues, greens. And this one, I'm gonna just use just some black paint and get a nice gray tone to the canvas. And by wetting that canvas a little bit, it helps, helps spread that paint out. And also by toning the canvas, when you go to do your first layer of paint or your underpainting, if you don't hit every spot on the canvas, you still won't have that really bright white shine through just because it already has a, a layer of some color on it. So you won't notice it as much. It won't be as visible. And the main thing we look for in painting is canvas cover. You just want to make sure your canvas is covered nice and good. Don't have hollow spots on it. And I, I just recently started uh, doing them with this, this uh, grayish tone. Uh, for the for the longest, I like using uh, raw sienna or uh, even uh, burnt umber as a as a toner for my canvases. But recently, I, I, um, I don't know. I just said, let me try just a gray tone. And for in some instances, I think it works better with the gray tone, especially if you're going to have a deeper and, and darker background. That dark, that grayness helps those dark color, colors bounce immediately. And so essentially this entire background is going to be black. So I figured I'll tone it with the, with the black again. So that first layer of black will really start to pop already. Get a little bit more paint here on my palette. And don't ever be scared to like uh, move your painting around on the easel either. Because it wouldn't be comfortable for me to paint that low down. So I'll just flip this upside down so I can get to this area. We're just the same way. And this doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't, I mean, as long as it's transparent and you can still see your image under there. All right, 
And that's pretty simple. Like I said, you can do it any color. It, it, it doesn't matter what color you do it. It just helps not to paint directly onto a white canvas. So you'll, you'll, you'll be able to see the whiteness of the canvas through your paint, and it makes it look uh, dull and, and kind of flat. So tone your canvases. Some people use uh, gesso. I don't really put gesso on my canvases. I think uh, the acrylic uh, tone or wash roughs the canvas up enough where those those oil paints are still really attracted to the fabric. So, and this is a, a really easy step. So let's take this off of the canvas. I mean, off the easel and put a different canvas up. So I'm working on several commission pieces, but at the same time, I'm still working on some art for myself. Uh, this piece right here is another installment to the reader series. She's holding a book written by Dr. Amos Wilson entitled The Falsification of African Consciousness. And so this is a, a piece that I've been wanting to do for a while, because once again, I think it's an important literature that needs to be out there. And I've, I started this piece actually before a lot of these, <sighs> these revolts and these unrest has been going on in the streets. And, and so this is the information I think people need to be aware of. And so I just wanna keep trying to encourage people to expand their understanding of social issues and if i can do that in a in a painting it looks nice i think that's pretty dang neat so what i want to do now guys is get some colors on my palette and i normally oops I normally go from dark to light across my palette. And I'll do browns, reds, red, browns, reds, and oranges, and then the yellows at the end most of the time. So I wanna start here with two dark browns. Uh, this is a, a, a secret concoction that I made. <laughs> so these are both the same color. They're both Van Dyke brown, but they're two different brands. Uh, both really good uh, paint brands though. One of them is, is Grumenbach. And this paint is really nice and slick and really smooth. And this right here is uh, Windsor and Newton's Van Dyke Brown. And this paint right here, it has a lot of body to it. And so when I mix these two Van Dyke Browns together, I get this perfect color and perfect consistency for what I want to do. It took me a while to try that out. I was always scared to try to mix those two. So this is another Grumenbach uh, color right here. It's a uh, transparent orange. And I put this in a browns because it, it really does look brown to me. But it's, it's technically an orange. And then we're going to use some Gamblin. And this is a Venetian red. It's, it's really similar to, uh, to Indian red or, or light red. And a little magenta. And then we're going to put the yellows. I like this uh, raw sienna. There's a really nice, like, deep mustard color. And some more gambling. And this is gold ochre. For a long time, I, I used uh, yellow ochre for my skin tones. And yellow ochre, I still use it occasionally, but I like this gold ochre a little better. It gives, it gives almost um, a glowy, a glowy effect. And so these are my yellows and peaches. 
And like I said, I, I use a, a few different brands, but these are the ones that I stick with. They're either going to be Gamlin, Groomer Bach, or, or Windsor & Newton. These are really good products, and they're, they're fairly inexpensive. I think Gamlin is probably the more in, uh, expensive ones out of the paints that I use. But there's, they're still in a, in a really decent price range. They're not like um, Old Holland or uh, those Rembrandts. Those paints can get kind of pricey sometimes. So, in the last color is some flesh tone. So essentially, this is probably a normal palette for me, uh, and irrespective of what skin complexion or skin tone that I'm trying to create. If, if I arrange these colors here, my deep browns, my deep reds, my yellows, and my peach colors, I can create... I could paint. I could paint an albino or somebody from the Sudan with with this same palette of colors right here. It's very versatile. Uh, I've been using this same format for a long time, and these colors just just seem to work well for me. And um, and the brands of colors that I use seem seem to work well. So what I want to do is. some brushes um, and probably I'm going to use something like this maybe one of these and one of these Honestly, I want to find a way to get you guys a little, a little bit closer. Okay. And normally I like to start around the eyes. When you paint, if you can get the eyes to look right, everything else kind of falls in place. And Where did I put the photograph for this? Wow. Where's the photograph? Okay. Misplaced it for a second. It got stuck with something else because I left the tape on it. <laughs> All right. So take the image there, right beside it. And since I'm right handed, I kind of like to paint the same way you write so that you're not trying to go back and touch the same area. So I'm going to start at this eye and then work my way this way.
No. When I blend, when I blend my colors, well, very, very little amount here's from the edge. And normally I don't try to blend more than, than three colors at a time. It seems like any anything past sometimes maybe four, but once you start trying to blend three or four colors, it just turn muddy looking. So that's one of the main things I had to practice with is figuring out the tone that I want and which two or three colors is gonna give me that result. I always want to start in the, in the shadows, the dark areas. It's easier to to light to lighten up a darker shade than it is to darken up a lighter shade. So if you if you paint something too light and you you want to try to make it darker, it's it's really hard. So start with start with the darks first. The darker areas, your shadows, and then build the light around that. And normally it works. Sometimes you would have to do it in reverse just because one part of the image may be may appear to be in front of another part. I can go a little bit lighter. Get some of Naples yellow, just a little bit, and some flesh tone. I try to use one brush as much as I can, even if I go from the extreme of colors without like actually cleaning the brush. Uh, I used to, I used to think that you have to get all the paint off the brush each time if you're gonna change your colors. And try to use the same brush but it's not really necessary and then sometimes if you if you're washing your brush too much while you, while you're changing colors you'll, you'll have a lot of uh, thinner or mineral spirits or whatever you're using to dissolve the, the oils will stay in your bristles and then essentially they'll it'll get into the paints on your palette and and those those uh, mineral spirits dull the paint down dramatically. So if you just have a, a rag or a paper towel, and if you, if you wipe the pigments off good enough and jump into another color, it, it really doesn't disturb it that bad. And that's why I love oil paints. They're so versatile, they're so easy to work with, so forgiving on mistakes. And just by nature, the, the duration that they can last. I mean, that's why we still can, can see the Mona Lisa after, you know, 513 years or something. It was, it was, it was done with oil paints. I may have to add even one more lighter tone. Uh, if you notice, I didn't put any white on my on my palette, and that's because some people try to use white to lighten up other colors, and it 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 doesn't exactly lighten up lighten some colors up. White kind of fades the color, and and so it's always easier to try to find a lighter color to lighten up 
a color instead of just trying to throw well, white into it. Like I'm using this uh, really pale peach color to lighten up my deeper yellows instead of trying to ap apply white in there, which would which would fade it out and you would lose you would lose some of the hue. But there is a white that I do like to use. It's called it's called warm white, and it's kind of basically an off white or a bone white where it's not it doesn't have that really bright titanium white effect to it but it's it's still it gives you a lighter tone than your other lighter shades such as this flesh tone i'm using right now so i think i'll add some of that to this palette shortly And it's always good to have several projects going, going at one time, even if I'm not working on uh, a lot of commissions at once. I try to have at least three or four of my own personal projects going just to stay busy, stay consistent with your art. If you're going to take it serious, just stay consistent. And if you have, especially if you're, if you're working with oils like me and I don't think they take long to dry. Everybody complains about the drying time for oils, but you know, even even if a painting is, uh, you know, being kind of hesitant to to dry for you, you can just start another piece and work on another painting. And you work on that for a little while, and then the first painting will be dry. And if the first painting isn't dry yet, just start another painting and keep them in rotation like that. Just like I, I did a little bit on the client's painting and I got to a stopping point where it, it needs some time to dry. Once again, it's acrylics that I applied to the canvas and it'll, it'll dry in, a, in a, you know, 30 minutes. But in that 30 minutes while that's drying, I, I still have something else I can, I can work on. Persistence, persistence. And then you'll get into a, a nice routine of having several pieces going at one time. I know one of my, my paint buddy, it's it always seems like he's doing seven or eight pieces at a time. I'm like, dang guy. Oh, I'm gonna need that warm white. Where is this? There it is. <sighs> All right, just a little bit of that. And even with the warm white, I still want to be very, very gentle with it. Now, the eyes have so many different facets to it that they, they, to get it right, it does take a little bit of time and patience. And that's why I like working on the eyes first, because they are complicated. Just get the hard stuff out the way in the beginning. And plus it is the focal point of the face, you know, it's, 
it's just normal to look people in the eyes when you speak to them or when you, when you look at them. And so that's how we, we really acknowledge each other. Since work on the eyes first, get those eyes looking right. And then everything else seems pretty easy after that. Well, until you until you get the hands. <laughs> hands are pretty cool. I still struggle with a lot of things and I try to I try to challenge myself in, in every piece. Not to the point where I, I'm I'm frustrated and don't want to finish the piece, but on just technical levels, trying to do something that looks complicated. You know, I look at an image and I say, oh man, that looks hard. And then my next thought is, I want to try to paint that. So hands, uh, portraits in general are, are not the easiest thing to paint. And so just practicing, practicing, practicing. But hands are tough. One of my, uh, a young art buddy of mine asks, any tips on how I can draw better? I say, draw your hand. Every time you, you get bored, you, want, you ain't got nothing to draw, look at your hand and draw that thing. Different angles from the front, from the back, from the side, however, just draw, draw your hand, your fingers, your knuckles, and you will become a better artist. Do contour, contour drawings of your hand. Those are rough. I don't even like doing those. But the practice, you need to practice. And this model is actually a friend of mine who I met at our last year's Juneteenth celebration. Where uh, Terra Preta, Terra Preta Prime was such a graceful event host for us. It was an excellent, excellent day. Excellent celebration. Cannot wait until our Jubilee this Friday on the 19th. In Midday Park, not Midday Park, Nayard Park, in Nayard Park by the Everhart Museum. Scranton has so much cool stuff, yo. I swear. Now I want to go to Nayar Park. <laughs> Dang. I want to go now. I think I'm going to need a little bit more of an orangish color right there. I'm gonna take some of this Indian red, add a little bit of 
Should be a little lighter, maybe a little bit lighter. That's another reason I like to have the, the photo right here. You can actually kind of gauge your colors a little bit, and it doesn't have to be spot on every time. As long as your tones are correct, as long as your your uh, your tonal values are correct, the image is going to look correct. And that's why you can do monochrome and have a painting that's all green, but the tones, and the shades of green, makes it look like Gandhi or Martin Luther King or whoever, and it's just one color because of, of your tones. So as long, as long as your tones are good, your colors don't have to be exactly spot on with your reference. And that's just another way that the piece is yours. And that's, that's what the reference is. It's a reference. You don't have to recreate it exactly. It's just a reference source. I'll grab a little bit bigger brush. So in this paint right inside her glasses. And my, my pieces tend to have a lot of detail in it or a high level of detail. So I, I, I use a lot of small brushes. And then one of the, one of the main questions, and, and I, I ask other, art, other artists, geez, tongue is so heavy right now. I ask other artists the same thing, like how long does it take you to finish a piece? And you know, some people can do them real fast and it takes other people hours. And when people ask me and I say, well, that piece took me like 90 hours or 75 hours. They're like, wow, that's a long time. I'm like, yeah, like I use these little small brushes. <laughs> <clears throat> these brushes are so small. You gotta go really slow. But it's all worth it in it. It's all worth it. And so, like I said, I'm currently applying the third layer, of, the second layer of paint. But I, I normally I normally do at least three layers. So the first layer, which my mentor doesn't even consider a layer, this, this is just the underpainting, but I say it's still a layer of paint. So you do your first layer as, as dark as you can get it. Your second layer of paint, you really try to focus on your, on your mid-tones uh, and some of your, your dark highlights. And then the third layer, you really focus on your highlights and your, and your bright whites. And normally that should be it. Sometimes you, you may have to add a fourth layer or a fifth layer or a sixth layer, depending on the image you're trying to create and, and exactly how much detail you want to get into it or you know, just how complicated the piece is. But um, normally for me, Three layers of paint, three or four layers of paint, and kind of get it to that point where I feel comfortable with it. Once again, it's just taking your time, building it up. And when I when I uh, do 
in-person tutorials or art lessons and the one thing that's hard to get across so especially uh, a new start thing is the first layer of paint doesn't technically have to look good you know especially if you plan on doing two or three layers of paint on top of that no one's ever going to see the first layer of paint and some people want to take a lot of time to make it look good initially there's just that patience factor it's uh It's like constructing a building almost. Gotta have the foundation and then the supports. And then you put the roof on it. And all that good stuff. I think I wanna lighten it up right. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't like cleaned, cleaned this brush the whole time, and I've been in every, almost every color with this brush so far. Coming back with some more of this red, some of this going into this golden ochre. Trying to get that shadow that's right on the side of the bridge of the nose. Gonna go back into these Van Dyke browns. That's a kind of a dark shadow there. Deepen it up a little bit. Maybe even add some of this magenta. A little bit of magenta. It's too much. So it's amazing to see how the humanness, how you develop a humanness through paint. We're, we're running a little short on time, but um, we do want to see. Right. That's okay. It's, it's so fascinating. I, it's, it's really neat seeing how these, how the life of the person emerges through the, the paint, you know. Um, I love the process. I love the process. If so, you will be at the Juneteenth Jubilee this Friday, right? If people want to learn more and, and talk to you a little bit, right? Did you say that you're going oh. to be there? Yeah. Yes, I'll be yeah. there. Uh, be there for the celebrations, and it's, it starts at four o'clock. Social distancing, which is nice. It's in a park, so we can all be safe, but we can still yes. gather and celebrate. So, um, so we're gonna we're gonna have some live music. We're gonna have some drink vendors out there. We'll definitely have a uh, sanitation. Uh, yeah, no, I know, I know. Right. It's just and nice, being, but yeah. And wearing a mask and social distancing, but uh, you know, just a, a gathering, a, a jubilee, and, and yeah. solidarity. It's just much needed out. now. Um, yeah, and then I is. hope we can see this painting someday. Will you be? Sh hopefully, maybe when we can go back out showing that. You said that's one of your personal. Oh yes. By yeah. the time by the time the quarantine 
and yeah. I have a whole show ready. <laughs> yeah, so that's something to look forward to. Um, so yes. I just, again, I love seeing how it develops. Uh, the process is also an art form itself, just the whole, uh, you know, coming together. It's, it's so beautiful. Um, and like you said, we have the, the educational piece in there to, to learn about some of these great works. Um, well, thank, oh, go ahead, you were gonna say? Oh, no, that was yeah. it. Yeah, so thanks, Travis. And again, if you want to meet Travis in person and talk to him more about the process or, or the activities, please join us on, on Friday at the Jubilee. Um, and, and I can't wait. And now we're going to bring on somebody who actually paints in words. So I think that's a nice juxtaposition where we have a poet, Laurel Rajeski, that we're bringing on. But um, good luck, Travis. Can't, can't wait to see you on Friday. And, and um, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Maureen. Thanks for having me on and the opportunity to, to share my art with everybody. Yeah. Bye, guys. I'm so glad to have you on our show. Uh, welcome. Uh, you can see me smiling because I love all art forms, but poetry is probably my first. I, I used to do that as a kid. So it's so nice to be able to feature a uh, poet on the, on the television show, or, or I'm sorry, on, the, uh, on our live streaming. The world's so different now, isn't it? So um, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. Of course. Uh, let's talk about how you became a poet. Uh, maybe some of our you know, viewers are interested in that. How does one start writing poetry and, and make it, uh, you know, eventually where you have a book? Well, I would say that I started at a young age. Uh, my mother was writing uh, when I was a little kid. And I think that I recall writing my first poems in about second grade. Hmm. And I remember writing one poem that the teacher kind of really was, she loved it. And so she, took me out of class and she let me walk all around the ele elementary school and read it to the other students. And it was the first time that I kind of went, wow, this is interesting. Uh, and I just never stopped. <laughs> yeah, that's great. I, I, we've, we've had a number of that thing when you start little and, the, and it's, it just becomes part of your life and, and you can't imagine it without it. So that's, that's a great story. Um, so, I know you, you've had a lot of success as a writer. You, you've actually studied it and you had some what we call residencies where people can go and just have the nice time to, to just be a writer and not have to worry about other responsibilities, which is good for a creative soul. Can you, can you talk a little bit about those experiences? Sure. So I was very fortunate. Um, I was able to go get my MFA in creative writing at Goddard College. And I did a low residency program, which means that I was on campus for eight days a semester. And then the rest of the time I got to stay home and, and work on my writing. Uh, so I was able to live in Northeastern Pennsylvania, but go to an institution in Vermont. Um, and writing in that way, kind of just having little bursts where you were really involved in the creative writing community and then coming back home, uh, really set the tone for how I write now. Uh, I do a lot of, uh, you know, just kind of free writing and getting my ideas together for months and months. And then I usually have like bursts where I just have to sit down and really plow through all of that. Oh, that's a good word. Yeah, it's not always easy. Sometimes people think artists are just, you know, it does take a commitment. It doesn't just always come, come to you. It's, it's a discipline, so. And I, I plod through. I spend a lot of time revising and revising. Um, so I was fortunate in 2015, I went and I was a resident artist at the Worm Farm Institute which is a nonprofit in Wisconsin. Uh, they have an organic farm and they let artists of all different types live in the barn on their property. Um, so, and we also have to work. I had to work, I believe 15 hours a week on the farm. Uh, but in exchange, I had food and shelter and a place to work on my first book. So, and I was there for four months. Um, and at the end, I gained a couple pounds from all the Wisconsin cheese, oh. but I also had a first draft. <laughs> What a great experience. I know you and I have discussed that, but I just think that's so interesting that an experience that it's just fascinated and, and it led to something fruitful to your first book, um, which we'll talk about here in a second. But uh, what inspires you as, as a writer? That might seem like a cliche, a cliche question, but you know, what themes do you find yourself returning to or, or is it different every time? Well, it's something that I've been thinking about a lot lately because I've been spending a lot of time, like everyone, indoors. Uh, or, and I really find that I'm very, very inspired by things that I read. Um, so I'm someone who goes to the library multiple times a week. I just like browsing the stacks. Uh, but also, I am someone who really enjoys going out and being inspired by culture in the community. 
Um, so I go to a lot of poetry readings, plays, uh, you know, really any type of performance that I can. And, you know, it's those moments I always keep a notebook with me and, you know, I'll, I'll have that idea that goes, oh, that person said something that reminds me of this and I'll kind of jot it down. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's, I love that, uh, which leads us, this is a good segue into this question. You have also been uh, a great community artist here in Lackawanna County. Uh, you've received a, um, our funding before for your spontaneous poetry project, which I just think is one of the most unique things I've seen. I know you recently spoke about it at a TEDx talk put on by Jess Mione, and, and it's just been really um, a great project. Can you talk to us a little bit about what that was? Sure. So I started it about a decade ago. Um, honestly, I just, I was at an artist mixer and a local artist, um, I guess you could say promoter came up to me and said, you know, we want you to do a performance. What can you do? Uh, and I had just graduated from Keystone College. And so I thought, well, I write and I do theater. So how can I combine these? Uh, so I started writing poems on the spot for people. And it started with me timing the poems, just a minute per poem. So as I said in my, te my TEDx talk, they're really short poems. <laughs> but as the project has grown, I've incorporated a lot of different themes and elements, and it's really taken on a life of its own. Um, I love talking to people in the community, and I find that if you trust people to tell you their stories and say, then they'll trust you with them. Um, I have very emotional conversations with people. Um, and I think that it's nice because at the end of the interaction, those people get to leave with a poem. Um, and I think that there's nothing wrong with having more poems in the world, especially personalized ones. And it's a way, I think, to introduce people to poetry. Um, I think it's getting better, but I think sometimes people still think, oh, that's such a hard art form, but it's, it's really not. It's a very healing one. It's so important. Why do you think poetry is, is still important and can really help people uh, well, even now during this difficult time, cope, I guess. I think that there's, most people when, I, when they come up to my stands will say to me, oh, I've written poems before. Um, and there was this point in their life where they stopped. Sometimes it's in high school. Sometimes they're still writing. Sometimes they're not. But I find that that with a lot of art forms, you know, at some point in their lives, someone said, oh, you know, I can't really dance or oh, I can't really draw. And I think that that is, um, Disappointing. And so I think that my, this project that I'm doing, and there's uh, poets and writers who do similar things all over the world, I think that it gives people the opportunity to be involved in that artwork again. Um, and it's really exciting, I think, especially when people come back and they want a second poem. <laughs> Oh, that's fun. More seconds, please. Um, well, I, I, we want to get to your main presentation, but, but just, and I'm sure you're going to talk about this during your reading, but if people want to, um, maybe you could tell us briefly what your, this, I guess the themes of your book, for lack of a better word, or, or and, and how people can find you if, if they want to purchase. Um. Oh, sure. So my book, and I apologize for all the sticky notes, uh, my book is called Red Mother. Uh, you can purchase it on any of the online uh, vendors that you usually buy books from. You can also get it uh, from the publisher, which is NYQ Books. You can go on their website. Uh, there's also a couple of local shops. I know that right now uh, they have different uh, selling hours and different things going on, but uh, Comics on the Green has copies. Also, Library Express does too. Oh, that's great. That was a great story. When yeah. those venues do open up, you can. Are you, are you working on anything new? Uh, can we expect, you know, and again, it's not always about publishing. And, and in today's world, you can put poems online. I love that, that we're new. But uh, have you been writing during this period? I have been. Uh, I can tell you that I haven't been, I've been writing on the periphery of what's going on. Um, I find that usually I don't sit down and say, I'm going to write a poem about this. Okay. Yeah. I usually am writing and writing and writing and it kind of emerges what the poem is. I do a lot of editing. Uh, I was telling a class recently that this book, Red Mother, when I left the worm farm, I thought it was going to be a novel. Uh, <laughs> prose and writing I had. And then it was about two years of editing to realize that it was actually just the poems. <laughs> it's great. I don't know. I don't want to spoil it. People are into it, but it's you, your imagination is. I remember seeing you at the book launch and I was mesmerized at how um, beautiful, provocative, but interesting that book is. So I think it's a good one to read uh, during this time. So I'll encourage people to, to get a copy of that. But, uh, well, I will tell you that when I was writing the book, uh, one of the things that I thought I was writing about was food. Uh, but the other thing I thought I was 
really writing about were um, coal mines. Because, ah. And to be honest, I mean, when I was here in Scranton for years, I mean, I've been a resident of Northeastern Pennsylvania all my life. Um, I said, I don't want to write about coal mines. Definitely don't. Everybody writes about coal mines. And then I went to Wisconsin and I wrote a whole bunch about coal mines. Uh, so the project that I'm working on now is delving back into some of that content and new content. <laughs> oh, well, that's a great, you know, yeah, we love hearing stories about how um, Northeastern PA inspires for you. So I'm going to turn it over to you so we can all sit back and, and relax and, and listen to your poetry. So thank you again for joining us. Thank you. So I will start off uh, by reading a few poems from Red Mother. Uh, and this book, it's, well, it's a love story. Uh, and it's told from an unusual perspective, it's told from the perspective of a parasite. Uh, so when I read, what I normally ask is that you think of the, of the voice of the poem not coming from me reading, but instead coming from your innards, uh, maybe somewhere in your stomach region, uh, but could be lower or higher. Uh, so I'm just going to read a couple of poems and begin here. Need gnaws at me. It chews a hole in my spine. There is so little of me, I must burrow into you faster. Think of yourself not as small, but cavernous, deep with wet darkness, thick with honey, for that is how you are. When I was writing Red Mother, I spent a lot of time thinking about intimacy, but also about relationships, uh, the different types of relationships that we have, um, the different dynamics in them, um, and how, how we express ourselves to one another. Did you know that you glow, that I know you as I can, nothing else? You are a lighthouse guiding me on. There's no need for heaven when I have you. What I also like about parasites, and I guess I didn't say what I like about parasites, what I like about parasites is that there's so many of them. Uh, when I was writing the first drafts of Red Mother, I started researching parasites and I found that what I thought was an anomaly, something that doesn't really happen in nature, actually is pretty much standard. Uh, most things have parasites. And so when you start to think about, about them in that way, they become more natural. Where there was one, now there are 10. My small red eggs are well hidden. You will not know how many until your pores begin to weep. I, who did not want to be a mother, am now mother to all. Every hunger adores me. They scatter like sunlight, though some stay to comb my hair, move my limbs. Do you see that group of trees? Count the leaves. That is how many young I loosed on the world today. The other thing that I liked about researching parasites was that there were so many interesting examples. And what I found was that there's thought that a parasite could change its host's behavior. Uh, for instance, there are fish that when they are infected with a certain parasite will swim higher, uh, closer to the surface of the water. Uh, and they're more likely to be caught by a bird, which is the next cycle of the parasite's life cycle, the next host. Uh, and if that fish doesn't have the parasite, well, then that bird is a less of a chance of catching that fish. And so in some ways, parasites continue uh, ecosystems. The other thing that I like about parasites is that they aren't always welcome. And I like the thought of exploring the depths of something that isn't welcome. I will drag myself through a tree for you, also for a piece of you. Show me half to the tenderness I give. I double dog dare you. Why am I being followed? Who have you sent to claim me? 
When your centuries come to call, I unzip them like oranges, fashion a cape from the pelts. Don't kick me out. Who knows what would move in? Why would you ever endeavor to be so alone? I can show you ways to curl and bend. You could be my dancing queen. We could be a warm miracle. You are a wayward steed, yet without you, where am I to rest, to keep a store of bread? Where will I not be chased with whips and flames? When I was writing from the perspective of the parasite, I tried to think about what it would be like to come into being always needing someone else, always being dependent. So this is the last poem I'm going to read from the book. I remember waking. Cracking the hull was hard going, but I had a hook on my head that bit like an old fashioned can opener. The metal kind, with wheels of teeth, I gleamed like that. Stabbing upward, I thrashed my way out. It took more time than I'd ever been alive. When I emerged, the world was smudged, black and gray. I stayed still. My body was too soft, too porous, as if I would burst at the slightest touch. Then in all the dark, a faint glow appeared, far away, then near me, over me, the great ship of your body became the sky, and I knew you were mine, because you are. So now I'm going to read a few poems from a new project that I'm working on. Uh, when I went to the Worm Farm Institute, I said that I was thinking that I was writing about food, and I ended up coming out with something very different, but I still was writing a lot of poems about food and some of those over the years have become new pieces. So I'm going to share some of those with you. Uh, this first poem was published in the Fermentation Fest Farm Art Detour Guide. Uh, every year in Wisconsin, the Worm Farm Institute uh, hosts a big fermentation festival uh, in Sauk County. And so this poem was written for that. It's called Grocery Store Tomato. I bought a tomato from the grocery store in May, cold and hard and smooth as a shiny egg-shaped clown nose should be, icy. I bought the same tomato in January, the same tomato in October. Sometimes I buy many smaller tomatoes and place them in a bowl on the counter, like a bird's nest full up with almost life. Sometimes I smear mayonnaise on the coral flesh or dribble a drizzle a double dose of oil all over. I buy shares of tomatoes in February, make salads with tomatoes in December in Minnesota. I grill tomatoes in July in my backyard, or I would if I had a backyard. I hold these tomatoes to be self-evident and lightly salted. There's a way to cut an apple in half, revealing a star of seeds, a way to peel a tomato and see arteries, Slices of tomato can be stained glass or for sandwiches. Cubes of tomato can be stacked to form igloos. There's a line between people who are devoted to the real deal, a juicy sweet tomato straight from the farm, and those who grab the tomatoes I buy at the grocery. We try to meet in the middle, converse and compromise, but it's like comparing peaches to cappuccinos. There are so many tomato languages, dialects continuing to swell and split. If I were a tomato, I would have a brown paper bag to crawl into when I wanted to feel warm and alone and ripe. So on the theme of groceries, uh, I've been thinking about groceries a lot, probably because the grocery store is one of the few places that I get out to these days. Um, I'd like to read a poem that explores differences in the grocery store. Um, the project that I'm working on, I try to imagine the grocery store of the future, where products are new and improved and maybe a little different from what we're used to. Uh, so this poem was published by the Plume Literary Magazine, which is published by Keystone College. It's called Cantaloupe Shark. 
swims while sleeping with thick rind hide, layers of flesh and fruit. A great delicacy to have meat and sweet melded as one bite, though keepers must be watchful. Too many in a tank and the fish go soft. Tussles lead to bruising and often end in rot. This next poem is based in the produce section. Uh, I, was, I, I like the thought of things acting in ways that make grocery store situations difficult to manage. Um, I know that currently there's a lot of changes happening in them. Uh, so this poem, which was published by Crab Orchard Review in one of their special issues, uh, explores what would happen if some of the produce were to start flying. It's called Levitating Acorn Squash. We tried wire mesh first, but the gourd slammed rhythmically into the metal. Indents became holes. Those that punched free smacked against ceiling tiles, vents, showering strings of seedy flesh. So next we tried shatterproof glass jars, kept them in, but most just massed themselves to a pulp in a day or two. Now we use nets weighted down, keeping small groups together. A narrow channel releases one or two at a time. It's a winding tunnel, fully covered with a few black tablecloths dug out from the back room. Guiding each squash through takes a caressing hand, a watchful eye. We give instructions for home transport on a little flyer, but most shoppers come prepared with a bowling ball bag or an outdated purse. Zippers are essential. Snaps or Velcro never hold. Customers like how the chunks of squash don't sink to the bottom of the soup or sauce, but instead glide and hover just above the steam. So the next poem I'm going to read uh, is a new one. Uh, it's something that I've been working on over the past few weeks. There we go. And it's called, well, I'll, I'll read the title. I think you'll know what it's about. <laughs> this season's trendiest masks are hot off the sewing machines. Are you tired of wearing that old bandana from your ex's Halloween costume? Stuck in the rut of wearing paint splattered masks from your last home improvement project? Don't wanna be seen in that handmade mask your mom made again? Are you looking for a mask that is fashion forward, functional, and fabulous? Well, look no more. Check out these stylish face coverings and find the new you. The blingaling. You'll be the belle of the online video chat with this flirty mask. Features a splash of rhinestone studded over your choice of fabric, pink polka dot or starry night. The tree hugger. Prefer a more natural look? Try a 100% organic hemp hand-sewn mask featuring all natural dyes and embroidered ear elastics. 10% of every sale will be used to print educational pamphlets about deforestation. The techie. Got a geek in your life? Gift this 5G Bluetooth equipped mask with USB charging port and six gigabytes of storage. Choose from gray, white, navy, and rose gold. The imposter. Ready for a conversation starter? Protect others while wearing a mask from the limited edition Famous Faces collection. Current models include the Julia Roberts, the Groucho Marx, and the Cheshire Cat, whiskers not included. Unfortunately, the Cindy Crawford and the Joker are currently out of stock. Welcome to the jungle. Animal lovers will go wild for masks all about fur and feathers. 100% vegan and cruelty free. Choose from leopard, peacock, zebra, flamingo, panda, and penguin. Last but not least, the deluxe. Looking for sophistication with a gasp worthy price tag? This season's must have luxury couture mask is a thousand thread count Egyptian cotton dripping with diamonds. Hand wash only, of course. So I'm going to read for you just one or two more. Uh, so this is a poem. Uh, so I'll back up a little bit. Uh, so for several years, and I'm still working on it, but I took a break. 
I was working on a project where I explored the personal lives of English alphabet letters. Uh, it's kind of one of those projects that I pick up every few years and then put it down. It'll be finished someday. Uh, but I'm really excited about the personal life of the letter M. Uh, and M has a very specific thing that she needs in her life. This poem was published in Crack the Spine's anthology on routine, and it's called M's Purchase. M needs to buy a house so that she can have a dishwasher. Marriage, children, love, all factors, but the first priority is dishwashing machine. Suds, rinse, and dry, she will never feel sponge or towel again. Until then, every moment at home is spent with dishes. Washing, drying, stacking, unstacking, and shifting cabinets over and over, always staring at the smeared backsplash spiraled from her circular scrubbing. The rings of her effort to erase the dazed waste are being etched on the palms of her hands. She believes there is poetry behind these walls within her cellular hands. She submerges them in dishwater to stop their singing. And the last poem that I'm going to share with you uh, is a poem that I wrote a long time ago, but it's one of my favorites. Uh, I was asked to write a poem about how I wrote which a lot of writers are asked that, uh, you know, how do you get things started? And so this poem is called Birth. At a poem's birth, the temperature runs in one direction, either to warmth or else a quick chill. The first few words plop out on unsteady legs, bleating, bleeding, pleading for mercy or mother, but my poems will find no comfort with me. I am horrible to my poetry. Neglectful, untrusting, unfaithful, I make my poems wish they'd never been born. Hastily scribbled, my poems become shut-ins, banished to drawers of similar pages. I rip, stamp, muss, and use greasy fingers. Sometimes my pages line bird cages. Yet, how else could I treat a verse? I, who also emerged shaken, stunned, cold light, the mercy of soft hands, the chill of existence, these are birth. I cannot give anything but what I knew. Thank you. Well, that was uh, just uh, beautiful. Um, I don't know where I went. Um, hold on, sorry, <laughs> technical. Uh, um, there we go. <laughs> After six, after what, seven weeks, I'm still learning this brave new world. But I think I got lost in your poetry. And I was laughing because uh, my name begins with M and I don't have a dishwasher and I could totally. Ah. <laughs> and you think being home with the pandemic, your house would be spotless. But I think it's always like, oh, I can just do it tomorrow. <laughs> you know? yeah. And then they, they all pile up. But just a couple of thoughts before we, before we bring on Jacob Cole, our next guest. But uh, I, you know, your poetry, I think this is what great poets do. They, they take what we might consider the mundane or just... Um, everyday things like tomatoes, <laughs> you know, or thinking about parasites and, and they make them into something beautiful, which you certainly did or, 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 you know, makes us think they almost become magical and, or even taking like this time, which can be very difficult sitting in our homes during the pandemic, but you you've made us kind of smile and, and think about how we're changing differently. Um, and even though it's serious, maybe maybe opening up to that part of the world that is creative because people are making very creative masks uh, and doing mm -hmm. other creative yes. things. So, so I, re I really enjoyed that. Um, and hopefully as our viewers and I switched to hearing uh, Jacob Cole does very relaxing music, I, I know that sometimes for me, poetry lines stay in my head and I keep returning to them. So, so you gave us a lot to, to really think about and, and carry with us. So we hope to see you again um, here, or hopefully in the real world at some point when we can do poetry readings again. Um, so that wish, would be good. <laughs> I know, <laughs> that, there's nothing to replace that, but uh, this is better than nothing. And good luck on your project. I can't wait to see how the, the food poems come out. And uh, like I said, hopefully we'll be able to, to hear those and, and have you back on again. So thank you, thank you so much. Oh, thank you for having me. Well, hi, Jacob. It's so nice to have you on the show. How are you doing? Very good. Thanks for having me. 
Yeah, well, you're, you know, you've been working with us for a long time in, in various, I think you might have done every program the county sponsors, a uh, half marathon, art in the park, our festivals. So, you know, we're glad we can bring you on virtually. And, you know, now we have a worldwide audience. We hope people are watching us from all over uh, to celebrate our Lackawanna County musicians. So you're a very talented percussionist, uh, but you're, you've really been focusing on the handpan in the past few years, which is I, just a beautiful instrument. If you need to relax during this pandemic time, this is the uh, instrument for you. But uh, well, let's step back a little bit and tell us how you, you got into playing drums and, and your musical career first. Sure, sure. Um, well, I've been drumming a long time. Um, I got my first drum kit when I was seven years old. So it really all started then, you know, rhythm. I've, I've been exploring rhythm since I was seven. Um, so it was drum set all the way up to um, college, basically. And I went to Berkeley College of Music in Boston and studied with um, Jamie Haddad, who was Paul Simon's percussionist. And he got me into world percussion. And then that's when I got into uh, things like um, the ocean drum. Oh, wow. <laughs> Very peaceful. Right, so he got me into the ocean drum, and then that led into Udu drum. <laughs> we should have a whole show of you just featuring. <laughs> <the drums. laughs> Which is a Nigerian clay pot from Africa. And then that led to tabla, and then tabla led to the hand pan. And uh, for those that don't know, a hand pan is like a new type of steel pan, right? The sound comes out the bottom, right? And they make them in different scales. So real quick, I'll just demonstrate. This is actually my buddy here. This is Ralph, my buddy from the Netherlands makes, makes these. His, his brand is called Ayasa. And uh, there's many different makers of hand pans now, but they were invented in 2000 in Switzerland, uh, originally called the Hung, or the Hung drum. So they're still a new instrument. They've, they've just reached their 20 year mark um, of existence. Wow. So it's, it's, that's where all my focus is now, pretty much. I have two hand pan albums that I came out with. Yeah. I actually just led a, 10 day intensive uh, hand pan workshop. We had 87 people from around the world sign up and we had 10 uh, t international hand pan teachers and we did a session every day and that just wrapped up, so. That's really, really exciting. Great. That's something that our little corner of the world can be so proud of that, you know, you have this big global connection, um, which is kind of neat. Uh, the hand pan definitely does that. Yeah, isn't that cool? And how can people find your, uh, CD, you know, your music. And uh, my website is jacobcolepercussion.com and you can find all the links to my albums. It's on iTunes or on Spotify um, and um, also links to my YouTube and SoundCloud uh, as well. I'm just going to give a shout out to your wonderful wife, Kristen Powers, who's worked with us for years. Very talented artist, but also a great marketer. So <laughs> I know Actually, she's... Yes, she, she is the reason behind this hand pan masterclass. She, she, she led it and she put it all together so thanks Kristen. <laughs> yeah no, and we will definitely have her on at some point she's she's I'd love to have her do a marketing workshop but um yeah I just I just wanted to give her a little plug. Um, definitely definitely. Uh just before we get started I know that he you participate in one of our programs which was the healing arts program at Geisinger Hospital outside the intensive care unit and can you just talk a little bit so people would play every Tuesday kind of the type of music you're going to hear the healing to help people calm down and cope with you know, really difficult situations. Can you just m talk a little bit about how that affected you and your music? Because that was one of the surprising yeah, definitely, things. Definitely, definitely. Um, that's that's a, you know that's that's one of the programs that um, I definitely miss you know doing. I used to do that with Mark uh, Woody at, and um, we do hand hand and violin music um, on Tuesdays there at, at the uh, third floor of Geisinger in Scranton and. Uh, yeah, we just kind of play in the hallway and, and fill the hallway with relaxing, um, you know, in my opinion, healing, um, hand pan and violin um, music, sometimes improv, sometimes um, songs off my album Hope, which is actually, this program is partially responsible, in my opinion, for the creation of my new album Hope. I'll just show you what it looks like, because um, it's really cool. Uh, the, the album just came out. Oh, yeah. Yeah, just in time, it came out right before all this crazy stuff happened, you know, 
and it's two discs. We got the sun and the moon, and uh, it's 24 tracks. And uh, yeah, this this was created because me and Mark were able to play on Tuesdays, and, and Mark ended up learning all my tunes and uh, coming up with his own parts on top of it. And somehow this this was, uh, this album came out. Yeah, the duo together is beautiful. I would highly recommend that. Again, it's great for um, relaxation, just beautiful music, uh, which is important. I just, thanks for sharing that story because I just love when um, there are surprises and how creativity, uh, creative collaborations come about. You don't know what's going to happen. So that's why I think community arts is so important and involving our musicians beyond just maybe the typical concert hall because, you, you know, it's so important to get in the community and you never know what's going to come out of that. So... Exactly. And I think, I think our music touched a lot of people in, in those hospital halls, for sure. It did. And, you know, it might be people coming through for a horrible reason, and maybe they haven't heard this type of music before, but they, they take that with them. And I, I think it, it definitely meant we got a lot of great response from the program. So hopefully we'll be able to bring it back in, in some form. But, uh, yeah, healing arts is definitely something that we'll probably see more and more of, um, you know, as, as the world gets a little more difficult and definitely, definitely. help communities heal after some of the things that are happening. But thanks for taking time to chat with us. I'm, I'm so looking forward and I, I think our viewers are really going to love this. Um, it's always good to talk to you. Um, and again, thanks for joining our show and looking forward to hearing you play. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Hey everybody, Jake Coyle here. I'm going to do a half an hour of some uh, improv exploration with these three handpans in the standing position here, which is new to me. So, this first one is a uh, Pantheon Steel. Uh, my newest pan, actually, a Pantheon Steel Halo from um, Missouri. Um, yeah, CA Egen scale.
yeah, that's uh, Halo. This is a uh, Axiom um, from Las Vegas. This is a uh, Asuchan Saladin from Switzerland. They're all different scales. <laughs> Oh, there we go. That's my new handpan album, Hope. Which none of what you just heard is on it. Because what I was just doing was new um, improv. Double disc handpan album. We got the sun, the solar disc, and the lunar disc for daytime and nighttime listening. 24 tracks featuring Mark Woody on violin on most of them, including my dad, Joe Cole on upright bass, John Ventry on electric bass, Roy Williams on guitar, acoustic guitar. Um, and uh, even my friend Ben Lee from college, who went to Berkeley with me and played in my college band, made it to a track. So there's a lot of different musicians. I'm playing drum set. Uh, and tabla and percussion and handpan, it's, it's good. JacobCallPercussion.com. You can check that out. I have stuff on YouTube as well. So, yeah, I'll do um, one more. Hope you guys are well. This is a new one as well that I'm working on. Doesn't have a name yet. None of these do, but, you know, they're all reflections of the time. Thank you. 
what time it is now. So I will do some, I have to sit to play this pan because there's bottom notes on it. This is a Yishima Pantam, one of the best in the world in my opinion from Israel. Thank you. 
something I'm called quarantine. So, uh, I hope everybody uh, had a good time. And again, check out my new album. Again, none of this stuff is on it, but <laughs> if you like the music I compose, maybe you'll like it. It's all hand pan and um, tongue pan songs, compositions of mine. And uh, it came out January 25th of this year, right before all this craziness. JacobColePercussion.com. It's on iTunes and Spotify. Violin, hand pan, lots of other instruments. All right, everybody. Be safe. Well, as always, I love hearing from our local artists on their process and their inspiration, and I hope you do too. So we will see you hopefully for the next Lackawanna County Arts and Culture Live. And in the meantime, please stay safe, healthy, and creative.